when I'm going long ETH, I'm receiving 10% ETH back, right? So I'm getting, let's say I put in one ETH, I'm getting 1.1 ETH. Now, the risk that happens is that the, the risk only occurs in a very specific scenario. And that specific scenario is if I, if two things have to happen, the value of the collateral has to go down, right? Which is what happens when the market starts to draw down, right? BTC ETH goes down in value. And that means that uh, the value of the assets go down. And subsequently at the same time, if traders are winning by going short, right? So traders are going short, they're winning more money out of the liquidity pool and the value of the liquidity pool is going down at the same time. When both of those two things happen at the same time, that's when you start to get very risky in the protocol level, which is why we believe in a single uh, stable coin uh, liquidity pool, because whether user, users go up and down, the value of the collateral stays the same. Podcast. Welcome to the Deus XDAO podcast. Today we're talking about Gains Network, a decentralized trading platform on Arbitrum and Polygon. I'm Kepler, and it's my honor to be joined by my co-host Turbo slash Abby um, on her first podcast episode. Uh, hey, Abby, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Kep? Great as well. Great as well. Um, yeah, today we have guest Ishan, who's working with Gains Network. Uh, could you maybe intro yourself first? Yeah. Um, hi, guys. Yeah, my name is uh, Ishan. Uh, I uh, am a core contributor uh, at Gains. I've been a core contributor for a little over a year now. Um, you know, a little bit of my, my background, I, I was in private equity before I got into crypto, um, had my own PE fund, um, and uh, yeah, and then caught the, uh, <clears throat> caught the DeFi bug uh, pretty early on in uh, 2019 ish and then uh you know once i kind of saw i had some friends show me all the early blue chip DeFi stuff you know maker of a pound uh and as soon as i kind of saw the blue chip DeFi stuff I, I kind of fell in love pretty immediately uh and then just didn't look back um started to work full-time in the industry started to contribute at a lot of different places um a lot of different um uh, depths that uh, you may know well um and then uh yeah and then started uh a little bit of a um, kind of go-to-market agency um, that helps uh, define infrastructure projects, um, go-to-market, you know, working with the most technical projects in the space, being able to kind of break those things down and, and kind of Eli five a lot of those concepts. Um, but yeah, spend a lot of my time um, over the past year contributing to uh, Gains Network. Awesome. Sounds cool. like you've got a very nice extensive background in the field, which is good to hear. Um, so moving on to gains, I guess, how you got involved with them, um, and then just a, a little bit of an intro on what they're building. Yeah. So, uh, you know, gains network is a, I do, is, is a kind of a suite of products and, the, and the, that main first product is, uh, G trade and G trade is a decentralized, uh, perpetual futures leverage trading platform, uh, that allows users that uses, utilizes a, uh, synthetic leverage trading architecture. Uh, in order to uh, allow users to uh, speculate on the value with high leverage, um, which all of that is to say that uh, it allows you to trade against a uh, synthetic oracle. Um, and that oracle basically, and, and that's what I think is kind of the, the key differentiation um, in the GAINS protocol. What makes GAINS really special is through this uh, chain link DAWN, which is a decentralized oracle network, which allows you to pull prices and pull a very fair uh, market value price for all of um for, for for a lot of different trading pairs and those trading pairs are you know crypto pairs that you know you may know and love um all of the kind of top you know let's say 20 or 30 on a coin market cap or a coin gecko but also we're able to do um you know indices uh you know we, we recently delisted stocks because there actually is is not a lot of um is is not a lot of support or demand for actually trading stocks on chain surprisingly um and uh yeah and so, but also you know it allows us to do everything like commodities and like uh you know gold and silver and oil and things like that so uh you know we'll basically allow you to trade anything any asset that you would like as long as we can build a secure oracle that can pull the prices for those assets with 
you know, leverage. Uh, Forex is also a really big one that we offer for uh, foreign currencies uh, that, that actually has a lot of demand. And, uh, you know, the, the leverage can range from, you know, kind of 100 to 150x on kind of crypto pairs, uh, all the way up to like even 1000x on, on some Forex pairs. That's cool. And I think like with these high amounts of leverage, we, what we get later into is the risk management side, uh, of course, that becomes really important. Um, so maybe as a first question beforehand, like how big is the team now? I know that like Seb started by himself, I think, uh, yeah. at first, uh, yeah, like how many people are you? And I think like most of you are still undoxed, if I remember correctly. Like how is it working yeah. like that? Is it? Like, what are the benefits? And yeah, is there like some trade-offs with it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, the, the team is probably something around, uh, I would say maybe 15-ish, um, ranging from devs, front-end, back-end, um, contract devs, uh, BD, business development, operations, and then a little bit of kind of uh, marketing and content. Um, so it's probably around 15. I would say just about everybody is still completely um, undocked. And, um, the reasoning for that is that, uh, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very interesting, uh, area of the market that is very geographically dependent. Um, and so people are much safer off, uh, being undoxed. I choose and I, I can be docked because the way that we work, that I work with gains is that I have kind of an entity that works through gains. And so I, you know, I, I've kind of taken the, the legal precautions in order to feel comfortable enough to be able to kind of work with gains openly, but then also kind of preserve my, um, I guess, legal, minimize my legal risk, I guess. Uh, but yeah, yeah. But so yeah, just to kind of go back to the question is like, like uh, yeah, like dev or uh, as far as devs, you know, Seb, who, who is kind of the founder of gains is he was a one man show for, for a very long time. And it's, uh, it's actually like incredibly impressive. Um, you know, anyone that's actually looked at or seen gains or played with gains, um, you know, can admire the, um, kind of ingenious structure behind it. You know, the, the way that the protocol flows, um, it, it, it's actually like an incredible development feat. Um, and that's why, you know, we've had conversations just on the business development side where I spend a lot of my time, um, with almost every big name in the space, you know, every venture capital firm, every project, because there's just so much admiration for the protocol and how it's been architected. And I think that's the one thing that people don't spend enough time appreciating in the space is like, there's like the pure coding side and the pure, just like, Hey, I'm the solidity develop, I'm the lead solidity dev. And I'm just kind of, uh, like actually, you know, going line by line in order to create the protocol, that's one half, but maybe the half that I think not enough people spend enough time appreciating is on the technical architecture side and actually understanding how uh, the protocol functions, how each contract by contract functions into, you know, each container and each repository. Um, and I think that's what really separates gains is like the way that the protocol actually flows um, in order to make, you know, a, an incredible, like, totally permissionless trading experience uh which is kind of what you know why i why i really wanted to work with gains and why i found it so fascinating yeah i think there's like a lot to be said about architecture that helps to be like gas efficient for example being composable like the gdi vaults now um so yeah i think like i agree with you that spending more time on like the r d side there is really helpful and if you have a person that can do this part or maybe even also do the coding part that's like you you already have a winning team basically um exactly so so the first area i would like to touch on is risk management kind of like a, as a broader area here um i think that what would be interesting for our listeners is just to see like what were your learnings along the development journey so what were like the challenges you faced and what were the improvements you had? Um, like can be generally at the start, but maybe later diving more into like the risk management side. So yeah. Could you give mm -hmm. us a rundown here? Maybe. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is, um, this is a very category specific issue. Um, so, so I guess like, you know, it's, it's most helpful to kind of peel all the way back. And so kind of like on like, not necessarily like the, I guess kind of like the history of trading. And so obviously like, you know, since you know, like since crypto kind of begun, everything has been kind of order book and that's why centralized exchanges have been so beneficial. Order books are a great way to run. 
um, you know, trading ecosystems uh, because it's buyers and sellers, take it, makers and takers, right? And so that allows for, you know, a pretty good amount of efficiency. The problem is, is that typically there's not enough liquidity. And so that's when market makers come in, right? And so, you know, market makers help you kind of fit in the holes in the order book in order to allow efficient trading to consistently occur. Now, centralized exchanges really like market makers because it makes them incur more trades. More trades means more trading fees, right? And so then with kind of the advent of the AMM, uh, you saw that ne you did not necessarily need to have um, maker and taker and order book style trades uh, because you can automate exactly who takes it, who makes and takes the trades based on like a single liquidity pool, right? And so I think the next logical progression um, beyond spot and and beyond the order book model is kind of the uh, well, is the Oracle model itself, right? And the Oracle model is something that's also popularized by other leverage trading protocols. And I think the main benefit that comes is the opportunity to take out high leverage. So if you think about a high leverage trade, you know, let's say I have a $10,000 trade at, uh, you know, 10x leverage, right? You know, that's $100,000 in, in buying power and trading power. If I have an order book and I'm using, you know, a $10,000 uh, trade with 10x leverage, so I have $100,000 in buying power. If I don't have a very liquid market, uh, I can clean up a whole order book and I can move I can potentially move a market, you know, a significant amount in just a single trade, right? So I can move a market, uh, you know, like tens of dollars, hundreds of dollars, sometimes even thousands of dollars, depending on how liquid the market is. Look at some of like the most illiquid uh, kind of trading pairs on like a, even like a Binance. Um, $100,000 in buying power can really move a market. Um, and so that's why, uh, you know, these Oracle trading models are really great for high leverage trading. Um, and high leverage trading is very important, right? There's obviously definitely a lot of risks involved, but there's also a very important place for futures trading in the market. And so well, essentially what an Oracle model does is it kind of combines four or five different price feeds and allows you to, uh, you know, uh, to pull prices and, and take, um, you know, take trading uh, entry values, right? Let's say I enter Bitcoin at 25,000. It allows me to take that over six or seven different exchanges and it's averaging those costs over multiple exchanges so that uh, when I, I accept a trade, you know, I can do a trade with 100x leverage and it's not going to significantly move a market. So now I can speculate over a wider range um, without having to, uh, you know, really like destroy an order book and then leave open for price manipulation and things like that. So, Overall, you know, it, it, it's a it's it's really important, and it has every you know order book has its pros and cons, right? For example, order books are not viable on chain at the moment, right? Maybe in some L twos, maybe on Solana and things like that, where these high throughput chains. Uh, but currently, order book dexes are just not viable on Ethereum mainnet, or even on like a Polygon proof of stake, or you know, I mean, no one's even really done it on Arbitrum yet as well, which is theoretically a higher throughput chain. Um, but like the you know, if you really wanted to make a good central limit order book, which is kind of the the dream of DeFi, the dream of DeFi has always been a central limit order book. It's just not currently viable on chain. So that's why we've seen this rise in these Oracle based trading platforms. Um, and that's why they've been so successful, because they really found product market fit, which is the ability to offer a higher level of speculation through kind of perpetual kind of leverage trading, perpetual futures leverage trading. Yeah, and I think like, when it comes to risk management here, when you add leverage, you add risk, not only for traders, but also, of course, for the counterparty. So comparing it more to like order books, if I'm like a market maker uh, on an order book, it's quite complex. And um, as you said, it's not viable on chain because basically what, what you have is, let's say you for, for like one trade to happen, you usually need like 10 transactions, which is like you pull, you, you have an offer, you pull the offer, you bid an offer, you pull it. Uh, so yeah, that's not viable. But I think what, what like this kind of like active market making model gives you is granularity, I guess, and you can really set what kind of trades you want to take, right? And for AMMs, it's more like you're in passive LP and you're like your thread is basically like toxic flow, but also that you basically your, your whole portfolio doesn't, um, like takes on too much, uh, exposure to like one side, like directional risk, for example. Um, so could you run us through like how gains attacks that and tries to like help LPs basically to, to reduce the risk and to like, mm -hmm. to use basically market forces to balance itself out kind of, kind of like that. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, when building a completely decentralized trading platform, that's totally automated, right? There, there's nobody that's sitting there accepting your trades or declining your trades or anything like that. If a trade is open to be made, you can make it. Now, kind of backtracking a bit, I think it's important to understand how these trading platforms operate, which is basically um, instead of a market maker or an order book or someone taking the other side of your trade, we have a single liquidity pool, right? And in this case, our liquidity pool is just DAI. Now, I think it's important to establish why we choose just DAI versus other platforms that might use a multitude of assets, including Bitcoin, ETH, and USDC, right? So the reason why we choose to only do DAI is because there's a certain scenario risk when using the multi-collateral um, liquidity pool, right? And what that scenario, what that risk scenario is um, that these other platforms face is the debt spiral. And what that debt spiral is, I, I think debt spiral is not a great word, um, but but there is the, the, the risk that happens is that um, when you place a trade, right? In an order book, when you place a trade, someone else is giving you a trade. So you're taking someone else's making, right? So you're swapping, right? If I have USDC and ETH, I'm giving him US, I'm giving another person USDC and I'm taking on ETH, right? In a liquidity pool model, that is not what happens, right? In, a, in, a, in the LP model, what happens is uh, I'm trading against a single pool of capital and anybody can deposit into that single liquidity pool. And when I take a trade, let's say I, uh, let's say I buy ETH at $1,000, right? And ETH goes up to $1,100, right? And I go to sell that ETH. I made 10%, right? I don't actually get 10% Ethereum. Well, uh, if you use a multi-collateral model, you do. Uh, but if you use a single collateral model like a DAI, like Gaines does, then I just receive 10% more DAI. So I'm basically posting DAI collateral and I'm receiving DAI returns, right? In a, in a, in a multi-collateral model like a BTC, ETH, and USDC model, um, when I'm going long ETH, I'm receiving 10% ETH back. Right. So I'm getting, let's say I put in one ETH, I'm getting 1.1 1 .1 ETH. Now, the risk that happens is that the, the risk only occurs in a very specific scenario. And that specific scenario is if I, if two things have to happen, the value of the collateral has to go down, right? Which is what happens when the market starts to draw down, right? BTC ETH goes down in value. And that means that uh, the value of the assets go down. And subsequently, at the same time, if traders are winning by going short, right? So traders are going short, they're winning more money out of the liquidity pool, and the value of the liquidity pool is going down at the same time. When both of those two things happen at the same time, that's when you start to get very risky in the protocol level, which is why we believe in a single uh, stable coin uh, liquidity pool, because whether user, users go up and down, the value of the collateral stays the same. So that's one of the big risk mitigation strategies is that not allowing for multi multi pool collateral using just a die stable coin. Uh, we also think die is like very decentralized, right? Even though it is like highly backed by USDC, it still has that extra layer of Ethereum backing where it's not as risky as a um, <clears throat> as a USDC by itself. And we also, we, you know, we also have looked at and considered multi collateral. We've looked at LUSD, we've looked at FRAX as well. Um, so, so we think there are a lot of other interesting opportunities within the stablecoin space. Currently, we don't think FRAX, uh, even though I am person like me personally, like Ishan, is a, I, I'm a pretty big maximalist. You know, I, I, you know, I, I love the FRAX team. I, I know the FRAX team very well. And so while I personally am a big fan of FRAX, we don't think that the value of bringing it on reduces, mitigates the risk. But, uh, I, I guess now I'm going on a little bit of a tangent. So, um, going back to kind of risk mitigation in the gains network framework. Um, th there's a lot of different ways that we try to reduce risk, right? So when you have this open trading, um, you know, kind of ecosystem where anybody can trade and you have a single liquidity pool that is counterparting all your trades, uh, you know, the when, when traders lose, let's say I, I have a negative peanut, let's say I put in $1,000 in ETH and that $1,000 goes down to $900. So I lost 10%. The, where does I, I receive my 900 uh, my 900 die back? Where is that extra 100 die going? It's going into the liquidity pool. So all the liquidity provider, all the liquidity providers split that one hundred dollars um, amongst themselves because that's the negative P and L. Uh, that, well, that's a negative P and L for me, but that's positive P and L for for liquidity providers. So that's one way that is risk mitigation. So that's a very um, 
it, it, it's a very important component because not only do those liquidity providers, do they receive trading fees, but they also receive positive or negative P&O. So if you flip it the other way, right, if I'm winning a trade, I'm taking money out of that liquidity pool and users are, their net is trading fees minus the P&L and that's their net that they're getting. So ideally you want to keep your total wins and losses as in traders that are winning and losing relatively equal so that you're getting mostly trading fees, right? And then trading fees are going to GNS stakers, trading fees are going to uh, uh, going to liquidity providers and trading fees are also going to the developer fund, right? So that's one of the biggest risk mitigation strategies. So recently we we changed up our, our, our trading fee kind of architecture, or I, I guess not our trading fee architecture, our, um, um, what's the word, uh, the, our, our funding fee and borrowing fee model. So, so prior to, uh, I guess a couple of weeks there, I guess a couple of months ago at this point, um, we would have uh, funding fees and those funding fees would be basically, um, you know, every time you opened a trade, uh, you know, you would have to receive, uh, you know, kind of, you, you would have a funding fee and that funding fee is actually transitioning to a borrow fee. So that borrow fee actually basically goes back to more of a traditional kind of long pay shorts model. And that's kind of the most ideal model for these type of infrastructures where like the more longs that there are, those actually pay, uh, well, I, I guess that's traditionally how the model, well, model was, is, um, you know, longs pay shorts. And so when there are more long traders, those long traders are actually paying the shorts. Um, and, and so you want to do that in order to mitigate the risk of, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, mitigating how many people are directionally one way, right? The worst thing that can happen in these types of protocols is where everybody is getting directional, right? So if everybody's going long, so let's take the Luna situation, for example, that's one of the earliest kind of things that happened at the protocol. Um, uh, you know, when when too many people are going directionally one way and that trade ends up winning, then that's when the liquidity pool can really get damaged and actually can get pretty under collateralized in certain cases. So that's why the most riskiest thing that can happen to these type of synthetic leverage trading models is like black swan events where everybody's going directionally one way. And so then everybody's winning a single trade and there's not enough trades on the opposite side to counterbalance. And then that's when things get pretty risky uh, as far as uh, too many people winning, too many people taking money out of the liquidity pool. And then, you know, people might start to want to take their money out of the liquidity pool because things are getting too risky. Um, so there, I, I guess I'm kind of rambling at this point, but there's a lot of risk issues within this eco trading environment. And so the whole kind of developer ideology is always, how can we mitigate these risks? So minimizing open interest is a way where, you know, there can only be so much total open interest on a certain trading pair. That's a big way to mitigate risk, right? Um, trading, for, you know, uh, changing from funding fees to borrow fees, where just you're just paying borrow fees on the amount that you're trading. That's another way to kind of reduce the, the total risk um, that these things happen. So uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll stop there for a little bit. Yeah, no, that was uh, awesome. It was actually one of the questions I had. Um, I was reading today a little bit about the v6.3.2 you guys had upgraded um and i was just going to ask about like what the implementations were which you've just um explained but i did actually have a question following on from that so i read um that the changing from the um changing to the borrowing fee is that correct yeah yeah changing um, to borrowing fee yeah yep so uh it allows more uh open interest it allows people to increase the the max open interest or you guys to increase the max open interest so i was just wondering how um how changing to the borrowing fees allows you guys to do this yeah so so it, it's mostly about volatility factors right and so you know uh, uh, uh kind of kind of going back it's it, it's it's about you know it's it's two constantly changing dynamics that you're trying to to solve for, which is that one you want to be as risk mitigating as possible, right? You want to reduce all of the potential vectors that could allow people to potentially like exploit the protocol, way, right? Or 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 maybe win too much, right? Because then liquidity providers are at risk. But then on the other side, you're also balancing 
I guess, like keeping, I guess on the first hand, that's also keeping liquidity providers safer. You want to keep liquidity providers safe so that uh, more people want to provide liquidity, which makes the protocol even more safe, right? So you want to encourage more liquidity providers so that you get more liquidity providers so that it increases the safety of the protocol. And then it creates that positive flywheel. Now, on the other side, you also want to have a, a protocol that's easy and fun to trade on, right? And so you want to be able, you know, th there's no point of having all these liquidity providers and these liquidity providers won't really receive anything if people aren't trading on the protocol itself, right? So you really need to kind of balance the uh, ability for, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 traders to speculate at kind of the level that they want to and in a way that they want to, while also being able to protect liquidity providers at every level. And so, you know, uh, you know, volatility in the market, which, you know, we're obviously in like the most volatile market probably in the world um, on like a day-to-day -day basis, right? There really is nothing more volatile on a day-to-day, week-to-week -week basis than crypto because it is the most nascent market. And so uh, having such a volatile market means that uh, you really have to think about every single angle in which the volatility can kind of, uh, you know, open up attack vectors or, you know, uh, highly, as some people would call them, like highly profitable trading strategies, right? Um, and so one of that, one of those ways is, is volatility. And so, uh, you know, basically you're, you're by, by changing into a kind of borrow APR, um, this can uh, essentially allow, uh, you know, people to uh, have more open interest because you can have a, a, a better ratio of longs and shorts uh, because people are paying that extra borrow factor, right? And so that extra borrow kind of percentage allows you to keep more open interest because you're not actually providing a significant amount more risk to liquidity providers. Um, so, it, it, so it allows you to have a, a significant amount more total open interest. But then I, you know, in crypto, uh, just like every protocol, there's a significant amount of trade-offs. And, uh, you know, the, the trade-offs that are being made is that then we can't allow for some of these uh, trading pairs like stocks because that makes them not as viable. Um, so it, it, it's always, it, it's just a constant game of trade-offs and um, kind of, it, you know, increasing efficiency. And, and this is just one way that we're able to increase the efficiency to allow more open interest, which means more trading can happen on the platform, which can then, you know, give more fees to liquidity providers, which then encourages more liquidity to be provided. So it, again, it's just like this constant game of tinkering and playing that allows you to kind of maximize your capital efficiency while kind of decreasing your total uh, kind of risk profile. Uh, yeah, that this one point I wanted to touch on that you just mentioned is the trade-off that it's not really good for like trading of stocks, for example. So as you mentioned before, you basically, yeah, delisted stocks and indices, right, for from trading. Was that more of a decision from like risk management or was it more from like there wasn't enough demand? Um, yeah, what were like the reasons behind that? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, j just like everything, you know, unfortunately, it's never black and white um, in, in this space. And so it, it's a combination of both, which is um, it, it is a risk vector. But it wouldn't be as big of a risk vector if we can get both side action. And so if we can get longs and shorts, and then we're, our, we're keeping our volatility premium pretty low, our volatility factor. But the problem is, is that there's not a ton of um, action on both sides. There's not a ton of trades being opened on both sides. So then what happens is you have, you know, let's say $100,000 worth of open interest. And then what happens is you have one whale come in and say, hey, I want to go. 30x long with three thousand dollars on airbnb stock and then it opens up this whole kind of risk potential of having all of this one-sided open interest uh and and so it, it's a combination but uh, yeah so it's, it's definitely a combination of uh not having enough volume which leads to more risk got it so basically because there's like no there's like not enough baseline trading volume you would have these one of events kind of having too much of an impact on the pool basically because it can't really be offset exactly okay. that's exactly what it is yeah okay um yeah i guess then like the last point we had for like risk management would be um like kind of like the the fallback mechanism right uh, the recollateralization uh, by minting gns so could you just give like a short overview and then we can discuss it more that's probably best yeah so um 
you know, so after we launched our 4626 vault, which allows uh, liquidity providers to deposit DAI and receive a GDAI tokenized receipt that represents their position in the pool, right? Or that's a one-to-one -one backing of the amount of DAI that they deposited, right? Uh, you know, we, we were really excited when we saw kind of ER64626 and, and, you know, the opportunity to kind of create this composition opportunity. So typically what happens is uh, users deposit uh, DAI into liquidity pool. And how the, how the LP works is, let's say the LP at a base is 100% collateralized, right? Which means for every dollar of DAI, there's a dollar of GDAI. Now, one of the cool things that happens within the gains protocol is that that 100% increases, right? It increases through most importantly trading fees, right? So the more people that are trading on the platform, um, you know, the more that, that, uh, the value of GDAI increases. So for every DAI you put in, you actually can get 1.01 .01 uh, GDAI. Your GDAI can be 1.101, you know, 1.04, 1.05, etc. Right. So you are only putting in a dollar, but now you can take out a dollar and five cents, right? 1.05 in that case. Um, and so the value of GDAI continues to increase with trading fees, but it's not actually only trading fees. It's actually positive, negative PL as well. So liquidity providers are taking on a risk where if traders win, they can go below a dollar. But if traders are losing, right, and more money is going into the liquidity pool, then it's actually going up. And so there's two things that happen, right? So on one hand, uh, let's say on the on the good case, right, or I guess on the good case for liquidity providers, if a lot of traders start to lose, you're accruing trading fees and you're accruing that uh, negative PNL from traders. So traders are losing, you're getting more money. So now your GDI can be worth 1.1, 1.2, even up to 1.3. Right. So you're 130 percent over collateralized. So for every dollar of die I put in, I'm actually able to get one point three G die out. Now, what happens is at at every certain level at one point one, one point two, one point three. Um, we're mo but mostly it happens at 1.3, 130 percent collateralization that we take that extra G die uh, that, that extra die that's in the pool above 130 percent. And we use that in order to. Uh, market buy and burn game GNS tokens. And so that's why we have one of the, I would say one of the most innovative uh, tokenomic structures, which is why we saw such a crazy price appreciation in, in GNS tokens over the past year, because it really is an innovative economic structure um, that allows that extra value accrual in GDI to actually benefit GNS token stakers, right? And so, 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 that it's actually used as an as an open market operation where the, the 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 they're actually automatically bought back and they're burned, which is why if you look at the GNS token supply since the start, it's actually deflationary, right? So I think we began with like thirty three million GNS tokens. Don't quote me on that. And I think we're now down to about twenty nine million. So we've actually lost about you know call that twelve percent of total token supply. So not many tokens out there that are actually losing token supply that are, are fully circulated in the market that are actually losing in deflationary. Um, and so, uh, but the, the negative side of that and the opposite side of that is that, um, you know, again, every single, uh, every single decision has a trade off in this space. And so what happens was, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, when, when the die pool gets under collateral, right? So it's at a hundred percent and it goes down to 90 cents. So for every dollar of die you put in, you actually are only getting 90 cents worth of die back. Um, and so how do we re-collateralize that pool? Well, we actually go and and uh, the you know the, the 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 gains network ecosystem will uh, go back and um, you know we'll we'll go on the open market and buy uh, gains network tokens and uh, sell them. Or I, I guess they, they will. Sorry, not, they will mint gains network tokens and then they will sell them in the open market in order to get more money to recollateralize the die pool. And there's a certain number threshold. I want to say it's like 95 ish or something like that. But we will take, um, you know, some of the money. We will go and, uh, well, this is all happens like basically automatically, right? Um, and it will uh, go on the open market. Uh, it will sell gain GNS tokens on the open market and then use that money that they made in order to recapitalize and pull the gas back to 100%. And so, uh, that's the, you know, both parties that, you know, die liquidity providers and GNS stakers have that sort of inherent risk, which is that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the protocol can, uh, you know, you can lose, you, you can lose money and you can make money, right? Which is the way that it should be is that you can't, there is no way to just have an unlimited amount of opportunity. Like there has to be some level of risk and that's the level of risk that you take on where if a bunch of traders start to win, then the pull can get under collateralized and that affects not only die stakers, but then also affects 
um, you know, that, that also affects, uh, uh, you know, GNS takers as well. Um, so again, that's like another risk mitigation strategy. Um, I think the good benefit is that, you know, most of the time with leverage trading, I mean, like you can look at our kind of Dune dashboard over the past year, most of the time traders lose, right? Like, you know, think about your average friend that trades. Your average friend is probably not a great trader. There are a few great traders out there, but that's why we have this risk mitigation strategies like, uh, you know, uh, like open interest capping and things like that, that help mitigate those risks. But, um, yeah, like, you know, th there's always inherent risks in every protocol. Yeah, so it's more of like a backstop when things go really wrong with like the rest of the risk parameters, I guess. And like one question I had, because it sounds kind of similar to like how Aave is working, right, with their backstop module. Um, so when you sell GNS on the market, if there's like no demand, you will get less die basically to re collateralize the vault, right? Did you think about like, adding another mechanic there. So for example, incentivizing people to having like bid offers there that in the event that GNS gets minted, that basically these will be the first people that will purchase GNS at a predetermined price or yeah, is there something like on the roadmap there to like maybe add to, to like the recollateralization? You know, there, there actually is a mechanism in there that is similar to that, where it allows kind of community members to come in and buy uh, and buy GNS at a certain level. Um, so there actually is a mechanism in there that does allow that. Um, you know, it's kind of similar. It, it is very similar to the Aave model. Okay, got it. Okay, that, that's good to know. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think that that's it for like the, the risk management side. Uh, I think Abby had some uh, questions around the features. <laughs> Yes, um, I did. So I've done a little bit of trading uh, on like FTX and Binance and stuff. So um, that's pretty much where like my experiences come from and moving into like DEXs, it's quite hard to find something uh, smooth like what I was sort of used to. Uh, and that's one thing that I have noticed with gains and I think is really cool. Um, first thing I wanted to to jump in and talk about was you guys have implemented a um, one-click trading mechanism. So um, for those that don't know, maybe just a quick explanation because I think this is uh, very cool um, and very much needed with, you know, MetaMasks and um, approvals and stuff. Yeah. So um, so, so uh, let, let me try to break down exactly how the 1CTU wallet um, kind of works, which, uh, you know, without getting like way too technical, because talking about, you know, like wallet security is like definitely above my pay grade, but, you know, j just kind of breaking it down in like the most simple sense is like, it, we basically create a, a, a small wallet for you that's used exclusively for trading. And so you take your main MetaMask wallet and you fund this wallet, this, and you put a pin on this wallet. And, uh, you know, the keys are only stored in your kind of current wallet i guess is kind of the way that i would think about it so you just create a pin you sign a message that approves your your one click trading wallet and then you fund your one click trading wallet and then you enable the ability to trade on that one click trading wallet and so uh, you know it, it, it's a it's a really cool way to allow you to trade a lot faster where you don't need as many approvals because it's almost like a uh, it's almost like a dust wallet that you can use to just trade specifically. So you take the one figure in MetaMask, you put it in this dust one click trading wallet, and then you're able to do all the trading, uh, all your trading without needing to, you know, approve every transaction and sign and, and kind of like go through all that multi-step process when you're trying to trade at a higher frequency, right? And so, you know, one of the really cool things that actually not a lot of people realized is that, um, you know, when we had the Arbitrum airdrop, um, a lot, a lot of our users actually received Arbitrum airdrops from their 1CT wallets. Um, so that was one of the really cool things about 1CT that that not enough people realized was that, you know, we actually had hundreds of users message us and tell us that they received like over a thousand, you know, we heard some in the multi thousands, um, like two, three, four thousand dollars in ARB just from their 1CT wallets. Um, and, and so that kind of shows you, you know, it, it, it's kind of like an innovative wallet structure that'll, that is kind of purposefully built to allow for a faster and better trading experience without, uh, increasing operational risk, right? So like you're not increasing the risk of connecting your wallet to kind of G trade. And so that was something that we were actually really excited about. And it was also cool that, you know, a lot of users actually got like double the benefit because obviously if you're trading on, on G trade, you know, you're are probably using your main wallet, your main MetaMask or whatever in the larger arbitrary ecosystem. So you're already kind of getting approved for the airdrop, but then you also received your airdrop in your one CT wallet. Um, 
So yeah, that, that was so it, it's basically just like a, a smaller dust wall that you can use to more easily interact with the the gains trading, the you know, gains network ecosystem. Yeah, that's um that's very cool about the Arbitrum airdrop that people got some um extra cash. Um so basically I'm not sure if I did read, but you just fund uh funds like the fees. Is that right? You keep your um so it's just like the gas fees, or do you transfer all of the, the money that you want to trade with? Um, so it, it, it's, it, it was actually made for the gas fees. I mean, you can kind of use it for both, um, but mostly it was made for just the signing the gas fees and doing the quick trades. But um, yeah, I, yeah, I, you, ideally you can do it for both. Like you can actually use it for the trading fees as well, but it was actually created originally just for um, kind of the, the, you know, using the, you know, Matic and the eight. Um, yeah. So that you can just kind of easily um, trade with the wallet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a really cool implementation. And um, yeah, something that I did notice with lots of DEXs was you had to sort of approve and then wait and then, you know, approve again. And um, yeah, so it's very awesome to see. Um, and then, yeah, I, I suppose that was it for sort of the the features. Um, I guess, is there anything else that you guys are looking to implement? um in the future um yeah i think um i i yeah i think the big update that we recently launched was kind of you know 6.3.2 which was trading from you know uh, going from funding fees to borrow fees and so that was kind of the big implementation that we were have, have been waiting on um you know right now our biggest focus are is you know as always you know we're all about risk mitigation um and so we're kind of just prepping for kind of uh, you know, when the crazy demand starts to come back to be able to have the infrastructure and the open interest in place in order to really, uh, be able to take on all the demand that we think, you know, is going to come when, you know, the market shifts. I think overall, you know, we just have this general thesis that, um, that, you know, more, uh, and I think you're seeing this with kind of, you know, Binance is, it won't even allow traders to trade using a VPN nowadays. Uh, I think you have Bybit that's required full KYC now. So I think you're going to continue to see this regulatory squeeze on, you know, you know, now there's talking about, you know, everyone's saying, I mean, people have been saying this for months, but everybody's saying now, like, you know, KuCoin, you need to get your money off KuCoin. And so the amount of places you can trade in a centralized way, and there, it, instead of taking on counterparty risk, I think that, you know, over a certain point, the, the way I kind of see it is it's, it's kind of like a two-sided graph where you have like, uh, you know, kind of counterparty risk and you have smart contract risk, right? And so over time, they're both moving. And I think they're starting to switch, which is this key inflection point, which is now um, when you have these battle tested, battle proofed, um, you know, uh, trading protocols like it, like a gains, um, that's actually, you know, been through the ringer a bunch of times that has shown through almost, you know, an entire market cycle that, um, that, that, you know, the, the smart contract risk isn't necessarily as high that you're starting to see this shift in mentality that the counterparty risk of centralized exchanges might actually start to become less than the, than the smart contract risk of using a decentralized trading platform or just like, you know, smart contract platforms in general. And so when that inflection point happens, I think there's going to be a really big shift in the world, especially in the world of like, I guess, like trading and speculation, where now people are going to feel more safe with their funds by self custodying and then utilizing trading infrastructures like gains rather than doing both with a centralized exchange, which is trading, trusting the counterparty, and then also at the same time, trusting, uh, you know, centralized entities um, it, it, so it, to, to hold the funds and secure your funds. And so I think that that inflection point is not super far away, which is why, you know, I'm pretty bullish on decentralized trading uh, because I, I, I think, I, I think we're pretty close to that inflation. And when that happens, we think that a lot of the trading volume is going to start to flood on chain. Um, because your only risk is really like self custody risk and smart and, and smart contract risk. And so if you start to weigh that versus, you know, third party custody risk and counterparty trading, um, you know, you start to realize like, oh, it's actually not that far off as far as combining both of those factors. So, you know, we're kind of prepping for when that shift happens, a lot of volume is going to come on chain and we want to be ready to kind of dominate and take all that volume. Yeah, I think I 100% agree with that. I, th I think we're a lot closer, especially with everything that's been going on and, you know, like the fud around Binance as well. Uh, yeah, I, I just 100% agree. Um, and even just, you know, having to send funds to an exchange uh, when you've got majority of your funds like in your wallet 
in your own custody um, is quite annoying as well. So it's nice to just be able to jump onto a DEX and um, and do it straight away. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that, that's largely our thesis, right? It's like, uh, you know, uh, more people are going to realize that it's actually uh, a pretty comparable trading experience. Um, you know, our, our, our trading fees are some of the lowest in the space, rival many, uh, you know, top sexes. And so, you know, we just continue to think that like we're, we're building and gaining market share in this market that's going to kind of 10x or, you know, 50x, maybe even 100x in size. Um, you know, even if you just look at, uh, you know, comparatively to the entire market, if you looked at right now versus, you know, 2022, maybe 2021, or even maybe 2020, if you look at the percentage of decentralized trading that happens out of total volume, uh, you know, we're still at a really great pace where, uh, so, you know, we, we feel pretty confidently that we're just growing in this market that's going to continue to grow. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's still, we are still early. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're saying that all the time, but it's still kind of true. So, uh, yeah, I can definitely see that. So, I mean, thanks for, for all the insights. I think like the, the last point would be for our listeners, do you have anything like what's in store next for gains? Where should they follow you guys? Where should they follow you specifically? Like just sh shill everything you need to shill. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Love the shill zone um, at the end. So uh, yeah, I guess, you know, most importantly, you know, uh, definitely follow Gains Network. You know, we're, we're big on Twitter. Join the Discord. That's where all communications happen. Um, you know, my biggest thing that I like to emphasize is if you're in this space, and especially if you're still in this space and kind of the bottom, the depths of what we think is probably the bottom of the bear market, um, go contribute somewhere, right? Like find a protocol that you really enjoy and or, or maybe a community that you really vibe with and just go ask some of the mods like how can i help right what can i do to help what can i do for you guys and find a way to contribute in the space there's nothing you're going to learn more than working in and contributing along um you know some of the smartest minds that are building you know what i, I hope all of us believe is kind of the future of finance and and how we think a, a new financial paradigm should look like so i would say like you know if you want to come and contribute at gains because you really love trading on the platform and you want to see this product succeed, like come into the Discord, come talk to me, come talk to uh, Vinciuki, come talk to uh, Brian or, you know, or, you know, all people that, all the guys that are on the team on the, maybe the community and, and mod side. And, uh, you know, come ask us like, hey, how can I help? What can I do to help? And, and you know, we're pretty like open arms and bringing people in and allowing people to contribute. So overall, like, my biggest message is always like, find a protocol you like because it's a brand you like, or it's a protocol you believe in, or you like the way the guys, you know, talk about the protocol and go contribute somewhere. So if you want to come contribute, like come join the Kings Discord. We're always hanging out in there. You know, obviously we have, uh, you know, kind of like uh, staff chats and things like that. But even the you know, Discord as a whole, it's like got a very trader kind of vibe to it. So it's always fun to kind of talking and, and shooting the shit in, uh, you know, in, in, the pro, in the Discord itself. Obviously follow Gains on Twitter. Um, you know, that's where we put out most of our updates. You know, check out our medium. You know, we spend a lot of time writing a lot of these blog posts that really help articulate exactly what's happening. Uh, you know, we're math nerds. And so, you know, we're in a very mathematical protocol. We're in a very mathematical industry. And so we like to get nitty gritty into the math. And, and you'll see that in some of the writing that we do. Um, you know, I, I guess like, yeah, you can definitely follow me. Like I'm on Twitter, it's the same thing. Um, you know, I've, you know, been tweeting in the space for a while and, um, you know, if you are looking for a job and you've been in the space for a while and you are pretty DeFi and crypto native, like hit me up. We're, we're hiring, uh, a, a lot at Scribe. So, um, yeah, it, you know, I, I guess like my most important message is like, go contribute somewhere, go help out, go do something. Don't just sit there and be value extractive and be kind of just trading and Dex trading and lurking on discords and lurking on Twitter and stuff like that. Like contribute, like help build something because that's what's going to pay the most dividend. It's like, uh, it's kind of the biggest lunch of your time. So um, that's always kind of my kind of, uh, you know, two cents. 100% agree with that as well. Um yeah, I suppose thank you so much for coming on. I've definitely learnt uh, quite a quite a bit on the back end. So, um, yeah, it's been awesome chatting. Um, and, yeah, everyone knows where to find Gains Network and um, Ishan as well. Cool. Yeah, appreciate the time, guys. This is fun. Thanks for tuning in to the Deus Ex Dao podcast, a place where some of the most progressive and innovative builders, thought leaders, and traders in the crypto space come together to discuss all areas of the crypto industry. Whether you're into DeFi, Layer 1s, Layer 2s, NFTs, or anything in between, we've got you covered. And as a reminder, 
Nothing said on this podcast should be construed as financial advice or as a solicitation to buy or sell any digital asset or security. The comments, views, and opinions expressed by the hosts or guests on the podcast are their own. As always, you'll need to do your own research.